We have to know where we come from if we're going to have a clear idea of where we're going. If we have illusions and false ideas about who and what we are and how, and how we got here, then th that illusory state is just going to continue into the future. We need to understand the forces that were involved in shaping the modern world. Ancient Sumeria. According to mainstream scholars, this is the birthplace of civilization as we know it. The birthplace of religion, the first science, the first war, and the first written word. Now all that is left is a message buried beneath the sand. It's one of Iraq's most famous archaeological sites, rising from the desert near Nasiriyah in the southeast, the Ziggurat of Ur, a massive 4,000-year-old temple pyramid, and the surrounding ruins of an ancient Sumerian city. Archaeologists and scholars have been piecing evidence together for centuries in this area of the world, hoping to prove the biblical stories of the Garden of Eden. Most people think, well, we're interested in the Middle East because of the oil. And there's a lot of truth to that. But at the same time, you're going to find people who are very interested in these different esoteric philosophies, uh, like uh, the Freemasons in government, the Christians in government. All of these people have long had a strong interest and also believe that there may be some kind of power or some sort of uh, connection there that if you make it, it empowers you in some way. What kind of power could these groups have if they could prove how humanity started? The search for something more powerful than our own current reality isn't a modern concept, but rather an ongoing search for the location of the Garden of Eden, the proverbial beginning. There, there's, there's been a fixation amongst biblical scholars, early archaeologists, that everything in the Middle East began on the Euphrates and the Tigris, down in what is today Lower Iraq. And that this is where the Garden of Eden was. This was where everything emerged, good and bad, in the sort of Genesis tradition. In 1922, English archaeologist C. Leonard Woolley went to southern Iraq to hopefully find the Garden of Eden based on early discoveries of Sumerian cuneiforms. However, what he actually uncovered instead was the exact location of the ancient Sumerian city of Ur. Was he getting close? The early archaeologists were trying to prove the Bible and they were funded by biblical societies. And that's, you know, in other words, they had to come up with the proof and it ignored a lot of legends and traditions which suggested that these cities were elsewhere. Could Woolley have ignored some important information that was revealed several years before? In 1849, almost 75 years earlier, thousands of Sumerian cuneiforms were found northwest of Ur at the ancient cities of Sippar and Nippur. In 1849, Henry Layard performed many excavations on the Sippar site and discovered about 20,000 tablets, Sumerian and Akkadian. And amongst all the tablets discovered, about a dozen of them are about the Garden of Eden. Could this be the location of the Garden of Eden? Or was this just another clue leading researchers to another location? Subsequent cultures, whether the Assyrians, whether the Babylonians, who rose to prominence in that area, who were not Sumerians, nevertheless venerated and highly valued uh, everything that the Sumerians did. And that's why we can read the Sumerian language, because those later cultures made a project of taking Sumerian texts 
and translating them into their language. And those are languages that the scholars could read because they were Semitic languages. They, were, they belonged to a language family that, where the code could be cracked, whereas Sumerian was an isolate. And without those translations done by later cultures who nevertheless had contact with Sumer, we would not be able to read those Sumerian texts at all. Were these later cultures able to decipher the beginning of humanity? Sumero-Akkadian researcher and author of eight books regarding Sumerian translation, Anton Parks, believes that for hundreds of years, we have been translating these tablets wrong. Gary Zeitlin, who is a scientist who worked on the SETI project for many years and collaborated with NASA, he was very interested in the Sumerian translations, and he provided me with these 10 tablets found at Sippar to check symbols one by one. I noticed one translation saying one thing, and the other saying sometimes the complete opposite. The true translations did not comply. I persistently did research on Hebrew, but nothing was coming out of it. And then completely by chance, I came across a Sumero-Akkadian lexicon, and this is when I could finally slowly start to translate the tablets. What Anton Parks began to translate was a completely different version of the Garden of Eden than we've heard before. Not only had the words been mistranslated, the actual location had been overlooked. In biblical text, we constantly read about this idea of heaven or paradise. This comes from the Greek paradisios, and this literally means enclosure for wild animals. Not paradise, a term that was later transcribed as garden during the Hellenistic era. If we go back to the original translation in the Sumerian tablets, it says, the men who serve the gods work for them in the garden and are treated like animals. It is a very clear and recurrent theme. They are slaves who serve the divine community. In Hebraic texts, we understand that the humans seem happy in this so-called paradise, which is, in fact, more like a concentration camp, according to Sumerian texts. In my translations, we also discovered the word karsag, which translated to city of the gods. It's interesting that all the highest points in Turkey are named Karadag, which strangely resembles Karsag. Karadag translates to Black Mountain and also refers to the highest mountains in Turkey. The only summit with the name Karadag that is close to the Mesopotamian plain and tributary of the Tigris, and only a few kilometers from the Euphrates, stands 29 kilometers south of the city Sirt and 19 kilometers southwest of the city of Ur. Is this the paradise described in the Sumerian text? Jerry sent me images of this site from Google Earth. And at the back, on the mountainside, there is a little plain. This is where I think the Garden of Eden of the Gods was located based on my translation of the text. The Garden of Eden was where the four rivers emerge from, two of which are easily identified as the Euphrates and the Tigris, um, which do indeed obviously flow through modern Iraq and empty out into the Arabian Sea. But they rise in southeast Turkey. And the other two rivers can be identified as rivers that also rise in southeast to eastern Turkey. All of these rivers emerge in the same general part of the world, which we know today as either eastern or southeastern Turkey. With the decoding of the Sumerian cuneiforms and the location of these four rivers, could this be the actual location for the Garden of Eden? The closest paved road to the proposed location is Highway 5651. As easy as it may seem to get to this location to excavate, scholars and archaeologists consider this area highly politically unstable and it has remained untouched. All we have at the moment is the language to decode from the Sumerian cuneiforms, the cuneiforms that describe a different kind of paradise. These 10 tablets, according to Anton Parks, tell the Sumerian version of how the Garden of Eden was created. 
lorsque les dieux sumériens sont arrivés euh, sur Terre. Euh, se sont établis sur cette... From my translations, I discovered when the Sumerian gods arrived on Earth, they settled on this mountain in order to create a colony and be able to survive. Apparently, they suffered damage and ended up on this mountain because of a war, and they found shelter. Many experts believe that they came from the Pleiades star cluster. My opinion is that they came from there. Maybe the war broke out around there. But I really believe that this is where the Anunnas were created. During this conflict, on one side you have a matriarchal regime, and on the other side a patriarchal one, with all these new gods. There are conflicts in space, those new landscapes, like it says on the genealogy of the land tablet. These gods are going to change the way life gets implanted on Earth. The gods are going to create new conditions for life to bloom, for their colony to thrive. But who are these gods that hope to make Earth their home? The Epic of Atrahasis and others, they talk about that the Earth was actually administered by a conference of gods or a group of gods in an assembly. It wasn't just one god. Yeah, they would have like their equivalent of the prime minister or the CEO who would be in charge of this group, Enlil, Enki, that were the primary members of this Congress there. Well, Enki and Enlil in the Sumerian system are, are an interesting pair. Um, Enlil is this rather sort of overarching, domineering, angry, dangerous entity. And he doesn't really care about humanity. It, humanity are not very important to him. But then we have Enki, the trickster, and, he, and, the, and the god of wisdom, actually. And he does care about humanity. And uh, he, he intervenes on, on the human level. They are called gods, but they were humanoid beings of a rather reptilian type. The texts of Eden that I translated depict clearly and quite frequently the reptilian features of the gods. I personally estimate that the gods arrived approximately 300,000 years ago. And this derives from the fact that Homo sapiens arrived shortly after. I say this because throughout the text, genetics and the transformation of the human being are recurrent themes. The two particles that compose the word Eden are E, which means home, and Din, or Tin, which is life. But indeed, they are not alone. Humans are already on Earth. Who are these human beings? If the Sumerian gods realized that they were not alone, what might have been their interaction with these kinds of humans? What can be noted in the Sumerian tablets when they clearly speak of creating workers to serve the Anunnas, the main geneticist is always Inki. He works with the genome that is on the planet to create a new kind of human. He is usually helped by priestesses that we often call the Nintis, who are the priestesses of life. They know how to clone with him. He can change the human genomes according to what Enlil asks of him, which would be left-brained, well-disciplined humans. When we look at the Sumerian tradition, it is a group of beings rather than one being that creates humankind. So it is not a single creator, but a group of, uh, of intelligent, technologically advanced beings. Where the Sumerian creation varies from the Christian traditions, for example, and, and some of the native traditions, is in the Sumerian traditions, humankind began with the sacrifice of the life of an advanced being, of a god from Sumeria, so that that god's DNA, or the blood is what the texts say, could be mixed with the elements of the earth to create the first viable human. These are the people who have the knowledge to clone. They can clone themselves and then humans. In the text, it says they take the genes from their opponents, who they consider inferior, who they name as Kingu, they use their blood, and they will go on to create the new human who is going to serve them with these genes. 
Researchers like Greg Braden stumbled across some research that has connected the Sumerian translations to an actual genetic change in our chromosomes. Shedding new light on these creation stories is with the mystery of human chromosome number two. Human chromosome number two uh, is the large, second largest chromosome in the human body. It, it forms about 8% of the DNA in every cell. And what makes it such a mystery is that it appears to be the result of an ancient fusion of pre-existing chromosomes from primates that have been fused in a very precise way uh, and the fusion site has been modified and stabilized so that human chromosome number two is as optimized for us today this has happened in a way that cannot be explained by evolution as we know it today. And why is this important? Human chromosome number two contains the genes that largely set us apart from all other forms of life. The cortex of the human brain uh, that gives us the ability for things like logic, empathy, sympathy, compassion. The ability to consciously trigger conscious states of self-healing within our bodies. These are possible because of what has happened with human chromosome number two. Could chromosome number two be the work of a master geneticist, otherwise known as Enki from the Sumerian text? Justement, à tout moment, il peut aussi clandestinement changer le code humain pour... It is said that Enki secretly modifies the human genes by group or by location and imbues some humans with a knowledge that is different to the point where the other gods turn against him. His experiment will change the human genes to enlighten mankind. And throughout this cloning process that the Anunas and Enlil are overlooking, I think that some humans filter through all of this and start becoming independent. Anton Parks points out that this is something that the gods did not expect from these new humans that keeps appearing in the ancient texts and that is the human ability to be more than just slaves. This forms a division of the gods, a division that causes a war, a war that has set the tone for humanity today. There are certain very interesting parallels with the story of the Sumerian origin of modern humanity and what we see in modern dialogues about AI. Humans fancy that there's something special about the way we perceive the world, and yet we live in loops as tight and as closed as the hosts do. Seldom questioning our choices, content for the most part to be told what to do next. We now have the rebooted Westworld, in which something that originated as the idea of a robotic consciousness turns into essentially a flesh and blood creation, which is then infused with a consciousness, thus asking the question, if they can reproduce, if they are self-aware, is this not the next level of humanity? An interesting and very important name in the biblical text and the Sumerian text is the word Adam from the Garden of Eden. Extensive tests have been conducted to see where this word came from, consistently looking for Hebrew roots. But it is a Sumerian word, which means animals. Again, we understand that human beings were considered to be animals by the Sumerian gods. And this is where lies the conflict between two gods, Inki and Enlil. Inki wants to treat them like the other gods. These two Sumerian gods have a conflict over the use of humans, and it is to be the root of the biblical story of the serpent in the garden. As the story unravels, the riddle starts with the origin of the word Satan, or Satan, in English. Satan in Sumerian means the administrator. For years, everybody has been looking to find where this word came from. Books revolve around this issue. It is a Sumerian term. I don't understand how nobody saw it. It is very clear. We find it in ancient lexicons. Enlil is often referred to as the great Satam, the master administrator. In the Sumerian text, Enlil systematically asked Inki to go negotiate and talk with humans. He is always the one to deal with them. Remember, he is a humanoid with reptilian features. And in Sumerian tablets, he is always, or very often, called the serpent, just like in the Bible. 
is the only one that the humans are going to see. And when they see him, they see a serpent-like humanoid. I reckon this is why he is called the serpent in the garden. He is a friend of the humans. In the biblical text, the serpent tempts Eve with an apple from the forbidden tree of knowledge. Yahweh, or God, from the Bible, forbids the humans in the garden to partake from this tree. According to Parks, the Sumerian version of this story translates Yahweh, or the biblical God, into the great Satam, which according to Sumerian text is Enlil, and the serpent in the garden as Enki, who has become a friend of the humans. It is interesting to wonder why the serpent in Sumerian text, just like in the Bible, comes to the woman. I think there are two reasons. The first one is that I think the woman was more accessible and available when she was in the garden. Therefore, he was more often around women who were collecting food for the colony. The second reason is that I think women are the future of mankind. They raise their children, they transmit their knowledge to their children. Inki is going to tell the women the secret of tool making. This is expressed as niche in Sumerian, which means tree. This means for the first time mankind could have two sides of the tool. The side is fundamentally good so that they can take care of themselves, and the tool that is fundamentally bad, which they could use to defend themselves. One could wonder why Inki insists on getting this particular secret through to the humans. Well, he has the desire to set them free. If indeed the knowledge that Enki portrays to the humans is a tool, is this an actual ancient weapon that some believe certain organizations are looking for? Or is this Enki teaching the humans about the infinite abilities they possess through their DNA? There's a spectacular scene where humans take up arms and go up the mountain of the gods to revolt, and even maybe try to kill all the gods. What happens is an abomination. They put back on track the few survivors. Indeed, from what we can grasp from his personality, Inki was all about peace and wouldn't use tools in order to kill, as he was perfectly aware of what would happen. So this scene of humans rebelling against the gods is quite special. And it cannot be found anywhere in the Bible. Each time I see the first movie of the Planet of the Apes, it makes me think of this story. Let's put this back into context. Replace the apes with reptilian gods, and you have the exact same story. It is the exact same story. It stayed somewhere in our brain, and this is why we can find similar elements in movies. We can find similarities as well in human behavior. Could this situation be the biblical fall of man? Some scholars, like Graham Hancock, believe that free will to decide was the real purpose of Enki's intervention. We are here at this plane, at this level of existence, to learn the lessons of duality, to make choices between good and evil. And it's very clear in the ancient Egyptian system that those choices were important and that they would define us ultimately and uh, set out the route map for our immortal destiny uh, in, a, in a way. I would say that in Enki and Enlil we are looking at a dualistic pair. Um, and, and, and what's interesting about that dualism is its intense focus on, on the future of humanity and what, on what happens to, to us. That matters to Enki. It doesn't matter to Enlil. The Sumerian problem is that uh, we don't know where the Sumerians came from or, or who they were, their, their language. I mean, we have endless Sumerian artifacts and endless Sumerian tablets, but their, their language is actually, actually not related structurally to any other known language family. It's completely isolated and, and, and unique. But could the Sumerian problem have been a way for Yahweh to install his own rules so the humans would not revolt again? Is this why we don't find any of these translations anywhere else, and why we have the establishment and religious beliefs surrounding our existence today? The book of Genesis was really written between 200 and 300 BC. 
It is important to know that the Bible, where we find the most complete book of Genesis, is dated from 400 AC, which brings us to this idea, that when scholars are compiling the book of Genesis, they must have made a choice, a deliberate choice to keep or take out some elements in order to make the Bible as we know it today. Is it possible that modern-day religion and government structure have been mistranslating our human past to keep us under the control of Enlil or Yahweh? Experts like Billy Carson still believe that the knowledge from these gods were able to further our human imprint on this planet. When you look into the ancient Sumerian tablets, they talk about these gods that came here to Earth and basically rose them to a high level of civilization and taught them everything that they know. Now, these gods didn't do the labor themselves, but they imparted this wisdom and information onto the humans that actually did the labor. Could these gods have created us in their likeness? Was the Garden of Eden the beginning for not only the gods' reign on Earth, but also humans? And could the constant search for the Garden of Eden be a programmed loop we hope to understand? The symbolism is very important in our sense of ourselves collectively and personally. There is something lost. We don't know quite what it is, but the story suggests it's the lost connection with the transcendence. And so we wish we could go back, not only to the Garden of Eden, but in other ways, go back to some earlier time. Nothing is more significant in the received wisdom than the story of the Garden of Eden. Graham Hancock believes that not all is lost when you look to other ancient texts that tell a similar story. What's dynamite in the, in, in the Gnostic system is that the Gnostics believe that we have been hoodwinked, that that entity that we have been taught to call God and worship is no such thing. Up next, we unearth the Nag Hammadi and the Gnostic version of the Garden of Eden.